Today, we're going to start the Weldon Angelos Justice Act and uh, ending the drug war. This has been an issue that's been on my radar for uh, since back in the 90s, uh, when a guy named Peter McWilliams wrote a book called Ain't Nobody's Business If You Do. And, you know, when I was in school, I went through the D.A.R.E. program and all that. And um, sure, drugs are bad. I don't think, you know, we're not, not arguing that. But he, in his book, Ain't Nobody's Business If You Do, he raised the question, well, why should somebody be incarcerated for the choices that they make about what they put in their body? And uh, he laid it out in a pretty compelling and convincing way that I never looked at the war on drugs the same way. He lived in California and uh, he was he had cancer and was uh, participating in the medical marijuana program uh, out in California. And the federal government swooped in to bust him and uh, in order to, for him to get out of jail, he had to agree not to use marijuana that was keeping his nausea at bay. And so they found him dead, choked on his own vomit um, in June of that year. And there's a lot of people all over this country who have been victims of the war on drugs. And you know, this legislative package to end poverty, end mass incarceration, and end the endless wars. The drug war has been going on for over 50 years. And 83% of Americans agree that it is a failure. So the question is not, is not whether or not we should acknowledge it. The question is when. When will we do something about it? When will we change course? And justice delayed is justice denied. There is no reason why we shouldn't be changing course right now. And so we have the opportunity to do that in 2022 by ending the federal war on drugs. I'd like to, um, I'd just like to read the, the findings from section 141 into the record and uh, the subtitle is cited, will be cited as the Weldon Angeles Justice Act. The Congress finds the following. One, in the 50 years since Congress's enactment of the Controlled Substances Act, which authorized and launched the harsh drug war policy sought by the Nixon administration, the United States has adopted increasingly punitive policies towards the possession, use, and distribution of drugs. The United States has built a massive regime to enforce those policies. Two, Congress and state legislatures have adopted increasingly harsh sentencing schemes, such as mandatory minimums, established far-reaching and oppressive civil sanctions and collateral consequences, approved policies weakening the Fourth Amendment for drug searches and seizures, and fostered incentives for aggressive and militarized policing in the alleged pursuit of drugs. Three, Every year, there are more than 1.4 million arrests in the United States for drug-related offenses. In over 85% of those arrests, drug possession was the most serious offense. Drug arrests disproportionately impact people of color and more commonly occur in historically over-policed, low-income communities. A criminal record, even for an arrest that did not resolve in a conviction, has a profound impact on individuals, often interrupting employment, housing, family relationships, child custody, and education. Four. A health-based approach to drug use and overdose is more effective, humane, and cost-effective than criminal punishments. Subjecting people to criminal penalties, stigma, and other lasting collateral consequences because they use drugs is expensive, ruins lives, and can make access to treatment and recovery more difficult. Five, despite high numbers of arrests and incarceration in the United States for drug possession, the number and rate of drug-involved overdose deaths has skyrocketed for over 20 years and continues at epidemic levels. In the first year of the pandemic, 100,000 people died by drug overdose in the United States. Six, harm reduction services and voluntary on-demand access to evidence-based substance use disorder treatment have proven highly effective in reducing overdose and the spread of communicable diseases like HIV and hepatitis C preventing drug-related injury, and improving health outcomes for people who use drugs. These services should be available on demand to anyone who requests them. Seven, far too many people who desire treatment face challenges that prevent them from accessing the services they want, including cost barriers, lack of providers, and long wait lists. On-demand access to evidence-based treatment saves lives, reduces crime, and saves money. Eight, Criminalizing drug use and possession reduces the amount of resources available for harm reduction and treatment services and deters people from accessing available services due to fear of arrest. Nine, punitive policies have achieved no reduction in supplies or prices, but instead have created unnecessarily risky and harmful conditions for people who use drugs. Ten, 
punitive policies have led to militarized tactics that thwart the spirit of the Constitution and have led to the deaths of innocent civilians. Additionally, the drug war apparatus has cost the federal government hundreds of billions of dollars in direct enforcement and incarceration costs. 11. While drug legalization cannot fully repair our broken and oppressive criminal legal system or the harms from 50 years of the war on drugs, it will help restore individual liberty, protect against some police abuses, better assist those in need, and save tax dollars. 12. In this moment, Congress recognizes that drug prohibition has failed just as alcohol prohibition did, and it is time to move the country in a new direction. This section closes with a sense of Congress. It is the sense of Congress that incarcerating or otherwise subjecting an individual to criminal penalties solely for recreational drug use is not justice, which the preamble to the Constitution requires be established by the people of the United States. I think, Ms. McShare, that concludes my testimony for, uh, for Section 141, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yes, we do have a question from Tony in California. Wouldn't this be better branded as decriminalization of nonviolent drug offenses? Thank you for the question. Maybe, maybe it would be better branded as decriminalization, but that's not exactly what this is. So I guess let's, we should just talk about terminology. Decriminalization means that something is against the law, but there's no criminal sanction for it. So think of jaywalking or getting a speeding ticket, right? You're not going to be, you're not going to have a criminal offense on your record, but it's still against the law and you can still be penalized. And so decriminalizing drugs, as many, many states have decriminalized marijuana, if not legalized it, is still ill, is still like in New Hampshire for, in North Carolina, it's, it's still against the law to possess marijuana, um, even if there's no criminal penalty. This legislative package will end the federal war on drugs. It doesn't apply to state laws. So if, if it's a criminal offense or a decriminalized in the state that you are in, that won't change by the passage of this act. What will change is the federal restrictions. So that's part of the answer. The other part is that by, by legalizing it, uh, we can, bring, we can bring, bring a lot of the underground activity, you know, in the same way that uh, we dealt with alcohol prohibition, right? Alcohol prohibition caused an awful lot of, of gang violence. And when we legalized it, we collected tax revenue, we made it easier for people to seek, seek treatment. And nobody, nobody gets shot over a six pack anymore. We don't have open, open alcohol markets. It's regulated. And, you know, during alcohol prohibition, we had 10, 10,000 people died from um, drinking wood, wood alcohol. The saving grace was that if you felt yourself starting to go blind and you started throwing up as quickly as you could, it might save your life. And so we have that same problem today with, with the war on drugs, where people don't know what they're getting when they buy something off the street. We see a lot of, of fentanyl overdoses. And so by legalizing it and opening up the opportunity to treat this as a health problem instead of a criminal problem, we will save countless lives. But to do that, you've, you've got to be able to legalize it and regulate. And that's what this, this legislative package builds a framework for.